Welcome to today's webinar hosted by E. Lotus and sponsored by Evergreen Herbs, your trusted source for quality CU content. With over 20 years of experience in providing educational courses, we aim to enhance your knowledge and expand your skill set. I'm Donna Chow, your host and moderator for today's webinar. Our goal for this session is to present modern practice, modern solutions, herbal success without writing formulas with Dr. Carrie Murphy. We recognize that Chinese herbal medicine often doesn't receive the attention it deserves in TCM healthcare. So webinars like this are crucial for helping both experienced herbal professionals refine their skills and beginners to embark on their professional journey. Today's webinar brings together three distinct groups of participants. The first one is our Watch It Free group. Our attendees have complimentary access to the webinar. Our second group who paid for the webinar can earn CEU credits in addition to joining us for today's class. And finally, our third group is our Gold Pass members who can enjoy full access to our live webinars, distant learning courses, and a library of over 3,000 hours of clinically relevant content. Gold Pass membership is valid for one year and includes a gift voucher from Evergreen Herbs. For today's special offer, we are providing the Gold Pass at $999 along with a $9.99 gift voucher for Evergreen's premium collection line formulas. All participants today, regardless of your group, you all have free access to today's webinar recording for a whole month, while Gold Pass members will retain access as long as they are members, making it a valuable resource for continuous learning and patient care. Before we get started for the class, let's go ahead and ensure that we have an engaging and informative session. Please do this right now and set your chat preference to everyone so that everyone can see what you're writing and be part of the conversation. If you have any questions for Dr. Murphy, please type them directly to the Q&A box so that she can see it. Then after the webinar, there will be a quiz available the following workday and you'll receive an email when that's available. Today's class will run from 8 to 5 p.m. with four breaks in between and lunch is scheduled from 12 to 1 p.m. Okay, so our speaker today is Dr. Carrie Murphy, a doctor of acupuncture and Chinese medicine in Milwaukee's historic third ward. Dr. Murphy specializes in integrative internal medicine, primarily working with patients who are also undergoing Western medical treatment. Her main focus is to help patients maximize their vitality while minimizing the number of medications and surgeries they have to undergo. Dr. Murphy has an impressive background Having been on the faculty at Pacific College of Health and Science for eight years, during her tenure, she served as chair of the Department of Herbal Medicine, taught integrative oncology and integrative endocrinology, and created and supervised a student acupuncture clinic at Chicago Women's Health Center. With that introduction, let's begin today's webinar and learn something new. Dr. Murphy, we are excited to see what you have in store for us, and we invite you to share your presentation. Let's get started. Thank you so much, Donna. What a great introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for saying hi in the chat. Make sure your um, chat preference is set to everyone. There are a lot of us here today, so I'm not going to be able to keep an eye on the chat, but Donna will. If you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A box and those will pop up. Um, but I do welcome people to have an active chat. I think it's really fun for you. And that way too, if I say an herb name or formula name that you're not familiar with, you can say, hey, did anyone catch that? Maybe one of your peers will be able to grab it for you. Um, if I start talking too fast, please put like sad face <laughs> emojis in the chat. If you're with me, if you know what I'm talking about, you can put some happy faces in the chat just so I can kind of keep an eye on you guys and make sure things are going well for you. Let me share my screen here so that you can see this awesome keynote. Okay. All right. So Donna, are you there? Yeah, we are here. Okay. I'm um I am not seeing my share here. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you, are, are you, where's the uh, note? What's it called? The you, are you using the uh, the Mac, right? Mac uh, PowerPoint player. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know where? Do you have it in your computer or no? Do you have it on? Yeah, it's on my 
It's on my uh, desktop. Okay, is it already already you opened up already? Uh, let me get that. Sorry, everybody. Take a sip of coffee. I know you West Coasters are at the beginning of a day here. Okay. There we go. Okay, now that's all right. All right. Sound looking good. Okay. Are we looking at a slide? This is what is your why? Yeah. Uh were you were you able to make it like full screen from your site? Right now we still seeing your background and then your test uh, bar on the bottom. Okay. All right. I think last time we did you there was a meaning I mean maximize the uh, the keynote. Maximize that, you know. Okay. Right there. And settings? Ah, uh, no, it's on the Donald Murphy right there. You did. Can you exit out of that menu? Okay, I think one of the green, green or the yellow button will give you the maximizer. Well, you're looking at what I'm looking at, right? Yeah, the little three okay. color, color on the left. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think one of the them. Green, yeah, the green one, I believe. That. You oh, hey, everybody. Yeah, I just learned what you say. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's... that looked good. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, well, again, thanks, Donna, for the introduction. Um, I wanted to mention also that um, I'm celebrating 20 years in clinical practice this month, um, which feels like uh, a wonderful milestone. Um, I'm very happy to be here talking with all of you. And I was reading some of your shares in the chat as we were getting started and really thinking about when we're busy at work and we have an active practice and we want to do as much as we can for everyone. How do we, how do we do it? How do we do it? So we have to really look at our time commitment and our patient's time commitment. And very often what happens um, is we learned in school that we need to write a patent form, that we need to write a formula for every patient that we see. And oftentimes we just, we don't have time to do that and we don't have the space to do it. I know in my practice, I don't have a big extra room for a full herb pharmacy and my patients, um, don't have the time and the energy. I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We don't necessarily have the time and the energy uh, to double boil some Chinese herbs every day. <laughs> and oftentimes people don't need to. So one of the things that I really want to talk about is why patents. Some of us got overwhelmed in school trying to learn um, herbs <laughs> because there's so many herbs and we have all these patients and they have all these problems and there are all these herbs and acupuncture is simpler we take a look at acupuncture and we say you know this patient has knee pain we put a needle in the knee we put a needle down the channel it's not a hard thing to do um but with herbs we can really get intimidated um so one of the great things about patents is compliance the first thing that we really want to think about um, is the best herb formula for a patient is the one that they take and the one that they take every day. So um, when we're looking at a busy, let's say, working mom with terrible periods, one of the really difficult things is when is she gonna make these herb formulas? She's not going to, she's sick of cooking, she's not gonna make extra stuff. If you can throw a bottle of herbs in your purse and you can have a bottle of herbs on your desk at work and you can have a bottle of herbs next to your coffee maker, that's gonna really work a lot better. Okay, opening the chat back up here. Um, I just wanna be able to see how you guys are doing. Second, um, I was the chair of the Department of Herbal Medicine at Pacific College for eight years, um, and I did teach a lot of herbs classes there, uh, but I'm not an herb genius. <laughs> um, I'm just a regular person, but Zhang Zhengjing was an herb genius. Sun Sun Mia was an herb genius. So we have these formulas that were already written, and they're very close to perfect. A lot of the herb formulas that we use are 
kind of unimprovable upon. And so in school, we learn these are guiding formulas and we should customize them for every patient. And there's a lot of beauty in that. And I am not here to um, put down writing a formula for a patient. But what I've found is the formulas as they already exist are close enough for 99.9% of my patients. And then for the other 0.1% of patients, we can order a custom formula. And um, there are a lot of places where you can do that. Like I use Camo Herbs in uh, New York. And Camo is really nice because you can write a custom formula and they'll make it into vacuum packs and ship it to the patient. So very unusually, I mean, very unusually, I will do that for someone. But what I've really found is the formulas as they already exist provide convenience for us and for our patients and they provide compliance and they provide genius and they're time tested so i can throw hahuan p in there with the best of them but to be able to use a formula that we really know what's going to happen with it we know if somebody comes back with a headache we can say oh that was the huang chi or that was the chai hu we know how we can balance that out and i'll talk about that a little bit as we go along okay Another thing that I really like is a patent formula, which is to say a formula that's already made in, in a capsule, in a bottle, or in granules. Um, I do use a lot of evergreen granules as well. They force a kind of focus and prioritization. So I don't know if you have ever had this situation. I don't know if you've had this situation this week, but you have a patient come in um, with a sort of something wrong on every level. They're exhausted they're fried, they aren't sleeping well, they have brain fog, their diet is totally off and they cannot seem to get their diet right. They're, you know, they have back pain, they have neck pain, they're not exercising, they're low energy. And you kind of go, if I wrote a formula for this person, it would just have every herb in, it, in the Materia Medica. So when you have to choose a formula, you're choosing a focus and you're choosing a priority. And that's something that can really, um, Help us to be precise. And this is something that one of my teachers talked about a lot, which I really carry with me, that doing one thing at a time, not one, but doing something that's a little bit coherent. So choosing to say, I'm going to, I'm going to tonify the spleen, chi, I'm going to nourish heart blood. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to do everything. I'm not going to also drain damp and transform phlegm and scatter cold and all the things. Yeah, this person needs all of those things. But when we try to do everything at the same time, we end up with a very weak effect. And when we really put our money down, you know, on one place, we can really start to get some results happening. This makes me think about early in my practice, I had a patient come in and she, um, I was working in Chicago then, and she was a classic Midwestern patient, very damp, really bad allergies. Um, she had PCOS. She had really loose, sticky stool. She had low energy. She had cravings for cheese. She just wanted to eat cheese and bread and rest and lie around. And she felt terrible all the time. Her periods were way off. And she had insomnia. And I was a junior practitioner. And I thought, well, all that other stuff goes in the category of spleen deficiency and dampness. All the other stuff, I've got her. Phlegm, I've got it. I totally get this case. But insomnia made no sense to me. I didn't see any blood deficiency signs. I couldn't, yin deficiency, no. She was like 22 years old and very damp. Um, and so I said to her, listen, everything about your case makes sense to me except for the insomnia. So let me just treat everything else and we'll put a pin in the insomnia and come back to it. So I gave her a great treatment. I sent her home with, I think, Shangsha Liu Junzitang, which as we all know, not an insomnia formula. And she came back the next week laughing. And I said, what are you, why? what are you laughing about? And she said, I slept every night this week. No other changes. Um, my phlegm is still the same. My allergies are still the same. Everything else is still the same. But I got amazing night's sleep every night this week. And so that also shows us that sometimes when you really get right in, like a really deficient spleen case, a deficient spleen can cause problems in every system. 
And to just say, like, I'm not going to go trying to run around and address every part of this case on the first day, you can actually start to get things done in a real way. Um, and then from our perspective, it's a manageable overhead. Um, any of you on this call who are herbalists, um, if you don't do the gold pass, do the gold pass. It's kind of a no-brainer because you you are going to spend $1,000 on evergreen herbs this year anyway, so you might as well get all these free CEUs. It's such a great service. I use it. It's where I get my CEUs. So welcome. Um, it's a Sunday morning. It is difficult to get our heads in the space to do this on a Sunday morning. So wherever you are, let's just take three uh, attuning breaths together so that we can dive into this because we've got some we've got some business to do today. All right. Uh, so get a straight spine, get comfortable in your chair for just a moment. We're going to take three deep breaths. Good. Now I know we have attendees from at least four time zones. Um, so now we're all here in the same breath space, even though we're not at all at the same time. Now that we're a little attuned, I want you to bring in for yourself into this room. Hi, Gary, it's okay that you're running late. Um, why you got into Chinese medicine in the first place? and why you want to get better at herbs. There is a, a Buddhist vow, uh, the Bodhisattva vow, and part of it states, may I be the doctor and the medicine. So we want to be not just with our knowledge, but with our presence, a deep offering to our patients. And when you study all day long on a Sunday, when you take your whole Sunday to think about herbs and think about your patients, whether you have 15 years of experience or five years of experience or five minutes of experience, you're de we're dedicating this to our patient's well-being and the patient who you will see this week and the patient who you will see next year and the patient who you will see in 10 years. So there is somebody who's out there waiting for you to have a realization that you're gonna to have today, or maybe learn a little something that you're gonna to learn today. Okay. All right. So I wanna know, I'm sure everybody didn't go to Pacific. I know how we taught it at Pacific and I know how I learned it at Pacific, but I'd love for you, pop it in the chat, how does Chinese medicine work? A patient comes into our office and how do we make a decision? What's the, what's the kind of concept of ch Chinese medical diagnostics? From the pattern, yeah. Thomas, make sure you're set to everyone. We diagnose patterns, right? Via the eight principles. Uh-huh, very good. Differential diagnosis. Checking tongue and pulses. What does that bring up for you? Do we only check tongue and pulses? How do we diagnose? Asking, listening, right? Smelling. I don't think many of us do the tasting <laughs> pillar anymore, the intake. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the TCM framework patient comes in, signs and symptoms. They tell us what's going on. They tell us their story. And I wanna say there's some research that the average patient gets interrupted by their doctor 13 seconds in to presenting their case, which is painful. I think we could really look at not being that doctor. So think about when your patient comes in and you say, what can I do for you today? Tell me what's going on. See if you can give them a whole minute or three whole minutes. It's a long time, three minutes. If I stopped and was silent now for three minutes, you'd be like, oh my gosh, this is forever. Three minutes of dead air is a lot. Um, and let them tell you the whole story. 
and don't interrupt. You know, if you have questions, you can hold the questions for a minute or two minutes and let them really talk you all the way through. Because very often, if we let our patients talk, and not everybody has three minutes in them, but if we let our patients talk, they'll tell us everything that we need to know without us having to ask and interrupt and inquire. And, but what about this? And what about that? I'm all for that. And I think we should be asking, we must ask those questions, but giving people a couple of minutes at the beginning, um, because also one of the biggest sources of anxiety for any patient in a, in a health situation is talking to the doctor and having to present their case again. And what if I'm not heard? What if I'm shamed for what I have to say? What if I, you know, and particularly in Chinese medicine, we're looking for stuff that they can't see about themselves. When you look at a patient's tongue, you can see something about them that they can't see about themselves. It's extremely vulnerable. So really being aware that we're taking that patient in and we're holding them in a safe place and we're inviting them to be really vulnerable with us and really show us what's going on so that we can diagnose whether we're diagnosing a pathomechanism or a pattern. Um, over the years, I used to be much bigger on diagnosis and now I'm much bigger on pathomechanism. And it's a subtle point, but when we say to a patient, oh, you have blood stasis, you have chi deficiency, it's a little bit of a judgment and it's a little bit of a determination. And oftentimes what I like to do is say, I think that these signs and symptoms that you're experiencing are arising from a bit of dysfunction where the spleen isn't nourishing the heart, the blood isn't being generated, the kidneys aren't showing up as much as we want them to for work. So our strategy is going to be that we are going to nourish the spleen to get that all moving and rolling again. It's got a little bit more growth mindset to it. It's got a little bit more sense of not the finality of a diagnosis, but just a sense of a strategy. What's the treatment strategy that we have? And really um, something that I witness with my patients all the time is they go to different doctors. In Milwaukee, acupuncture and Chinese medicine are not the first thing that people think of very often. So oftentimes my patients will come in and they've already seen eight or nine different doctors and they're very frustrated because doctors say, well, there's nothing on your, you know, your test is clear, your MRI is clear, whatever is clear. So you're fine and you want some anxiety medication. And they're not fine. They just have a clear test result, but they're suffering from something. And so a diagnosis without a strategy isn't really so helpful. What, what patients really want is to be received, to be seen and heard, and then for you to say, I know how to start addressing this. I think I know how to intervene. That's the classic TCM framework. And what I just wanna add in for today is the cause. What are the causes of the pathomechanism? What are the causes of the disharmony? So what I want us to be thinking about all throughout this day as we're talking is the patient has their symptoms, we come up with a diagnosis or pathomechanism, we look at the cause. What is causing this problem before we start thinking of treatment strategies? And then from our treatment treatment strategy arises the intervention. And the intervention is what we're gonna do about it. So for an example, put this in the chat. It really helps me because I can't see all of your faces. Um, so I'm like alone in a room right now. It helps me if you post something in the chat. What are some causes of back pain? Mm hmm poor posture, right? Kidney deficiency, blood stasis, injury. Yeah, what else? I'm thinking of the biggest one. Overuse, mechanical alignment, weak glutes, that's a big one, right? Okay, now, now arise out of your too much sitting. Kellen, you got it, that's what I was going for, emotional heaviness. Stagnation on many levels from joint to chi. Beautiful, exactly. In the United States, right? We studied Chinese medicine. And I used to think about this a lot when I was in school. This medicine was written for people who were not sitting at a desk all day. This medicine was for people, yeah, lifestyle, right? This was for people who maybe were farmers, 
you know, who had who had some toil and had some movement in their lives. And now the number one cause of back pain that I see in my office sitting in a chair all day. But it can also be an injury, an accident. One of the um, things that I look at mechanically whenever I have a back pain patient is tight hamstrings and a weak core. You know, if you've got um, weak abs, tight hamstrings, you might get tight glutes, tight psoas, tight piriformis. So the back and the sides are all locked up and the front is very like empty, you know, so thinking about what, what are the me mechanics of it? Are we setting up a body that can function without pain? A bad mattress. Are you sleeping on your futon from college? A bad office chair, any chair too much. And let's remember hating your life. What if you are stuck in your life and you hate your career, you hate your marriage, you wish you didn't live in, you know, wherever. And then of course, also certainly weak kidneys, stuck chi. And if we have time at the end, I'm going to talk at the end of the day, a little bit about second chakra dysfunction and all the chakras because um, Ayurvedic energy body, the chakra system and the channels of Ayurveda have a lot of resonance with what we do in Chinese medicine. And sometimes if you overlay the chakra map on top of the channel map, certain patients of yours will start to make a lot more sense. Okay, so we've got our causes. And we have to look at lifestyle. There's no way for us um, to work with, for example, back pain without thinking about the causes, which one of the causes, and this is holistic medicine. This is Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine doesn't start getting into acupuncture and herbs unless all this other stuff is right, you know? So we wanna look at the body-mind connection. How is stress sitting in the body? I, when I was, uh... <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna say it. When I was working at Pacific College, I was a student at Pacific College, New York. I started treating all these people who worked in the front office for neck pain. They all had neck pain. Like I was seeing five people in the front office for neck pain. And I started thinking, what on earth is going on in that office? So I did a site visit. I went up to the front desk and I said, I need to take a look at, uh, you know, the administrative offices here on behalf of a patient. They Somehow they let me in, which I think is really crazy in retrospect. But I walked around the office and they had terrible feng shui. Everybody's desk was um, facing away from the door. And many of them, they're like looking out the window, which is really nice from the perspective of having a view. But what I witnessed was their boss would walk around and silently walk into their office behind them and look over their desk at their computer to see what they were doing. And then be like, why are you doing that? Why are you working on that? That's not spelled that way. That's not spelled that way. So they were all like, oh, so stressed out from having somebody sneaking up on them over their shoulder. So the first thing I did with that batch of patients was ask them to turn their desks around. So when I could have been treating neck pain for those people, I could still be treating them for neck pain if we hadn't recognized that there was something going on in their life at work that was causing the problem. Does that mean that if they couldn't turn their desks, I couldn't do acupuncture? Of course not. So really looking at what's happening for you in your life and what's happening for you at work. If you're feeling really stuck and really miserable in your life, it's going to start to show up in your body. This is sort of the core concept of five element theory. It's the core concept of Chinese medical theory. If you are frustrated and you are not speaking your words and you are not able to express yourself, your gallbladder is going to start locking down. It's going to be in your jaw, your shoulder, your rib cage, your hips, your IT bands are going to be tight. Your lateral knee is going to be out. You're going to be twisting your ankle all the time. And we see these patients, they come in and they're like, oh man, I'm falling apart. Like, I think I'm dying. I don't know what's wrong with me. I've got TMJ, neck pain, jaw pain. I've got rib side thing. I got shingles last week. I have a tight piriformis and I can't do this. And I sprained my ankle and blah, blah, blah. And to us, we're like, yeah, the gallbladder. Are you frustrated at work? And they go like, oh my gosh, you're psychic. But we, we're not psychic. We can just read this incredible map that has been made for us and taught to us 
take a moment, honor our teachers and all the teachers in the lineage who have kept this medicine alive and taught it to the next generation um, and taught it to all of us. Uh, so let's remember our beloved teachers. Um, so we wanna do some stress management techniques. So we wanna maybe teach a little meditation. Uh, does anybody teach meditation to their patients? I'm gonna teach you guys a one minute meditation right now that Shannon taught me. Hi, Shannon. Thanks for being here. Does anybody feel like ready to do a one minute meditation? Okay, this is called the 333 meditation. I'm gonna type it in the chat. We're gonna take three deep breaths. We've already done this once today, but we're gonna keep breathing in a repetitive way throughout, throughout this whole day, we're gonna breathe. Okay, three deep breaths. And open your eyes if they were closed. Notice the brightest color in the room you're in. What this room, what does it smell like here? And one sound. And three deep breaths. You know, what's great about um, that meditation is that you can keep your eyes open the whole time. You can do it in a meeting. You can do it while you're driving. You can do it if you're about to give a presentation, someone's introducing you. Um, there are very few times when you don't have a minute or two to breathe and ground into the present moment using your senses. And you can teach that to your patients too. And it's nice because it doesn't... Um, it's not a meditation that's going to interfere with anyone's spiritual or religious beliefs. If they have a certain belief, that's just counting and looking, you know, so there, are, uh, I live and work in a place that's heavily Christian. And there are people in my practice who um, don't know that meditation is part of the Christian tradition as well. And they, they have heard that maybe it's not something Christians are allowed to do. So I like to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to breathe a little bit and to notice where they are a little bit. Um, yoga and Qigong, anything that you can teach your patient, a little stretch, or even just to roll their neck, you know, to set an alarm once an hour at work and just do a few twists in your chair so that you're not calcifying all day long at work, all week long, all month long, and then thinking you're gonna come in once a week for acupuncture and I'm gonna be able to reverse all of that. Um, a couple of other lifestyle things that I want to bring forward. Uh, one is nutrition. Um, if somebody has celiac disease, we're probably not going to be able to use herbs and acupuncture to make them able to digest gluten. If they're gluten intolerant, we might be able to work with it. Um, if somebody has, gluten is a real big issue. It's, it's up in my mind right now because I'm treating a lot of patients with Hashimoto thyroiditis, and I'm treating a lot of patients with rheumatoid arthritis and with lupus. And when you start getting into these autoimmune diseases, one of the things that we really find is gluten can be really bad fuel to that fire. So we want to make sure that people are doing as much as they can, doing as well as they can to not just eat whatever, you know, there are so many trends in health. And in Chinese medicine, we, we, we should lightly laugh about trends in health because we should be aware that depending on somebody's constitutional type and depending on what kind of disharmony they have going, there's not gonna be one healthy way for everyone to eat. The closest is probably Michael Pollan's food rules, which is eat food, not too much, mostly vegetables. That's right for just about everybody. Mediterranean diet tends to be right for everyone, but there are grains in Mediterranean diet which aren't right for everyone. There's fish in the Mediterranean diet and eating meat and fish isn't for everyone spiritually. So there's so many things that go into what makes a correct and proper diet for someone. And we really wanna be mindful of that and not just saying, okay, yeah, diet is not one size 
size fits all. We're certainly not from the Chinese medical standpoint. I remember uh, eight years ago, I was doing a training um, with some colleagues and somebody was teaching us about alternate fasting. And I said, okay, so with this fasting, you know, an alternate day fasting, what do we do with a woman's menstrual cycle? You know, is, are there are there weeks in the cycle when we don't want to be fasting and weeks in the cycle that are best for fasting? And the guy was like, oh, no, that doesn't pertain. You know, alternate fasting is great for everybody, all ages, all shapes, all types. There's no. And I was like, excuse me, are you a doctor of Chinese medicine? <laughs> because I think that we should recognize that alternate day fasting is maybe not appropriate for someone with raging liver and kidney, yin, shu, with yang rising, um, depriving daily, you know, hourly essence, post heaven essence is is not going to be the best fit. Um, not to mention that for the millions of Americans with disordered eating and history of anorexia, orthorexia, it can be really triggering to have those conversations. So just being really conscious about not trying to make everybody paleo. Um, although for some people that will be the amazing chef's kiss thing for their case. Okay. Um, and just to like touch in a little bit, nutrition does not equal weight loss. I see a lot in my practice that people equate um, a healthy diet with a weight loss diet, which is not necessarily the case. It can be, but it isn't necessarily. Um, not everybody is going to have the same body and not everyone is going to be at the same weight. And I had a patient in just this week who she's going through perimenopause she just graduated from grad school. She has had a little bit of weight gain, but she's certainly not anyone you would think of as being like, oh no, she has a health problem. And she said, and I'm really overweight and I know I need to lose weight. And I said, do you, are you really overweight? And she said, well, I, I just don't feel good and I don't feel comfortable in my body. And I said, is this a, is this a health issue or a fashion issue? You know, we can work with self-esteem if that's what the issue is. We can work with making sure you have a healthy diet. But when she told me her diet, it was really healthy. And when I looked at her blood tests, her cholesterol was like 160. And her, you know, heart rate, resting heart rate was great. And all the metrics that you would look at, her blood glucose was great. You know, she exercises five times a week. So really making sure that we're not being um, pant size Nazis, you know, um, and, and that we're taking our patients for who they are. It's not to say weight isn't an issue if someone is in, at the extreme high or the extreme low, but really noticing the difference between cultural norms and what's expected of how someone looks and someone's health, which are not the same thing at all. Um, obviously there are a couple of things that we can look at, sugar, alcohol, caffeine, you guys know all of that. Um, and I wanted to just mention sleep hygiene. Um, whenever we're working with somebody who has insomnia, my favorite insomnia case of my life was this young woman who came in and out of nowhere, she developed insomnia and she was having terrible nightmares and she hadn't changed anything in her life at all. Hadn't changed work, life, house, diet, no new stressors. Everything was going fine. Um, and we went through the 10 questions and then the 10,000 questions. And finally, I was just at the end. I couldn't think of anything that was going on. And I said, you know, what's the nature of these nightmares? And she said, zombies. And I said, zombies? And she said, yeah, I'm, I'm having nightmares about zombies. Florence, you're still beautiful. I'm sure I can't see you. But if you were beautiful in the Renaissance, you're beautiful now. <laughs> um, so she said, Zombies. And I said, have you by any chance been binge watching The Walking Dead before bed? And she went, oh, no. <laughs> so she had been and I'm not making fun of her. We have all done this. But she had been scaring the daylights out of herself watching zombie movies <laughs> before bed and then closing her computer and closing her eyes and going to sleep and having zombie nightmares and then not being able to get back to sleep. So this really wasn't a heart blood issue. Could a doctor give her Ambien for her insomnia? Sure. Could we give her Swanza Rentong for her insomnia? Yes. But is that really what's needed in this case? Or do we need to look at sleep hygiene? So sleep hygiene is first, you know, no zombie movies before bed. Second, energetically really thinking about taking your phone into the kitchen at an hour, like 9 p.m., 
and turning it off and plugging it in to charge for the night and checking it again when you get up and get out of bed and come downstairs at seven the next morning. Taking 10 hour breaks from your phone or 12 hour breaks from your phone. Not going to bed with a phone beaming into your third eye, information, all the information in the world and everyone's opinion about everyone's opinion about every information in the world. Taking the phone away and plugging it in in a different room, even on a different floor. I, I plug my phone in downstairs before I go to bed. And it's just not in the room with me when I'm sleeping and dreaming and thinking. So it gives me a little rest. And if I wake up and I'm restless in the night or I wake up real early in the morning, I don't just immediately pick up the phone. I look out the window. I look at the sky. I count sheep. Um, I meditate. I put my body into Shavasana. I rest. You get 80% of your rest from physically resting your body in sleep. So I make sure that I get that rest. So major, major, major part of sleep hygiene is not using devices of any kind after a certain hour, like 9 p.m. No TVs, no screens, no nothing. And picking up a book and reading some text, preferably something boring, maybe something you've already read before, that's going to quiet the mind and let your forehead rest and not have all this light beaming on it. That's what we really want. Okay. Um, no coffee afternoon, no chocolate at night, no sugar at night. And sugar is going to be a big thing that will come up again when we start talking about perimenopause. Um, and then I want to talk about the other part of sleep hygiene, which is cort cortisol. Cortisol is the hormone that when our adrenaline spikes throughout the day, like we see, oh my gosh, I have a notification on my phone, something pinged, something dinged. We get a little burst of adrenaline, a tiny one. And then sometimes we hear a crash and we get a huge burst of adrenaline. We run over or someone yells, what the hell? Or why aren't you on your webinar? You're late or whatever. You know, you get a big burst of adrenaline and then you think, oh my gosh. And then you type it, type, type, and then you fix it. And you're like, okay, good. But your body doesn't know that the typing fixed the adrenaline problem because our adrenaline um, in history has been when there was an actual crisis, like a bear came out of the bushes and came at us or a bison pinned us to the ground or there was a tiger. And so we get that big freak out. If we don't clear it from our body, the adrenal cortex will start pumping cortisol. And that cortisol is meant to keep the adrenaline in the bloodstream. And that adrenaline and cortisol in the bloodstream in a prolonged way all day, every day. And every time you get one of those little red email notifications, it's another little ping of adrenaline, another, another. And you get a little bit more cortisol coming in to be helpful. And the way that we want to reset that, why we want to reset it is you will wake up at three o'clock in the morning like this. <gasps> if you haven't reset your cortisol and then your brain is going and you can't fall back to sleep. So raise your hand if you are someone or if you treat someone. I can't see you, but just raise your hand, who wakes up at three o'clock in the morning in a panic. That is a cortisol thing because at three o'clock in the morning, think of our yin and yang cycle, midnight, right? We're at absolute yin, midnight. We're totally dead asleep. 3 a.m., that's three hours of yang rising within yin. The cortisol levels are starting to rise. If your cortisol levels are rising from zero, then you'll start to stir a little bit. Somewhere in the back of your mind, you start thinking it might be morning soon. If your cortisol levels are here because you didn't reset them, they'll rise like this and suddenly it's noon. Have you ever had a patient wake up in the middle of the night and be like, it's not that I'm panicking, but I just feel like it's the middle of the day. Like I'm wide awake and just I just get up because I can't sleep anymore. That's cortisol. So the ways that we clear cortisol, that we don't get stuck in a cortisol cycle are jumping jacks, um, twisting, vigorous twisting, one song dance party can really be helpful because you need to sort of twist your adrenals and move them. You can do punching, you can do Qigong, you can do cross country skiing, anything that like gives you some movement, walk a mile, run around the block, climb a tree, something like that. That's really vigorous until you feel a little, like a little rush. Ooh, and that rushes, that adrenaline cortisol got freed up, give you a little rush. And then they settle back down into their adrenals and adrenal cortex. You know, who's amazing at this is cats. Um, cats 
hear a noise or something happens or they have a dream and it wakes them up or a bug happens or whatever and they freak out and like they go trotting sideways through the room and they yowl and then they get the zoomies what are the zoomies it's them releasing the adrenaline and cortisol from the system and then when they're done with their zoomies they stop they have a little bath and they're back to completely placid so get the zoomies whatever however you need to do it if you don't have time to do that or you have a knee injury and you can't do that Longer exhales and inhales, very deep breathing and laughing and hugging and uh, sex, all does it. So any of those things that you and your patients can do before sleep are going to be helpful. Okay. Um, so given all this time we just spent on lifestyle, if a patient is going to continue to make the choices that are cause, causing the problem, is there anything we can do for them? Yes? No? What do you do when you have a patient with tight muscles but they don't stretch? You know? What do you do when you have a patient with uh, insomnia, but they won't put their phone away? Is there anything we can do? I know you're all practitioners, so what do you do in this situation? The spirit and the motivation. No and yes. Yeah. Linda, what's the homework? Like you give them something to read? Patient education. Yeah, the word patient. Isn't that funny? Educate my patients patiently. Continue to guide behavior. Put them to sleep with a treatment that, yes, right. Beautiful. Meditation and deep breathing. Good. We want to start by supporting the patient because oftentimes... Very often, our patients are doing their absolute best, and they don't have. When they come in, they they some patients come in like, I'm ready to change. Tell me what to do, and I'll do it. I will, I'm ready to completely rewrite how my day works and my night, and I'll do whatever you say. And some patients are like, it's amazing I even figured out how to make this acupuncture appointment. I'm so over water, like in over my head. So we start by supporting the patient. I love whoever said, um, give them a treatment that puts them to sleep, you know, to remind the body how to fall asleep, to reboot that whole thing. Have you ever, uh, have you ever failed to restart your computer for a year? <laughs> I do this sometimes. I just let my computer go to sleep every night. And then after about three months, I haven't restarted my computer. It's running pretty slow. And my husband explained to me that that's because every time you open an app, your computer dedicates some memory to that app. And so over a couple of months, I might have, you know, 30 apps running on my computer, even though I've closed them, there's still like attention allocated to those functions. And we're the same way. We, we need a reboot periodically. And acupuncture is a reboot. It's an amazing reboot of the system to help somebody turn, you know, just like anything else. If something's not working, try unplugging it and plugging it back in. And that's really where we start with support, understanding where a patient's coming from, validating their challenges. I work with a lot of working moms. That's a really hard situation. You know, we're trying to ask them, take time for you, do a little yoga, do a little deep breathing. And they're like, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. But in my free time, I enjoy going to the bathroom. That's what, that's what working moms do in their free time is they try to run to the bathroom and quickly pee, usually not by themselves, usually while solving a problem on the PTA on their phone. So just validating the difficulty of that people are going through in their lives, including the emotional difficulty of a cancer patient. And we're saying, well, I want you to totally change your diet and start doing yoga and this and that, but they might not have any bandwidth for that. So validating the change. So I love the first answer was no. And then also yes, um, because there are certain things where 
if a patient doesn't make a change, they're not going to be healthy in the long run. But we can rewire our own minds to say, and helping them to find their way toward the change is in fact our job. Our job is not to fix the thing. Our job is not to choose the acupuncture point that just clears that problem from their lives. Sometimes it is. But usually it's about giving the patients the vision and the path forward so that they can start to begin to see how to take care of themselves without us. Um, I really want to say lead by example is a big one. If you take your phone to bed every night, uh, it's really hard. You won't have the power in your recommendation to advise your patient to plug their phone in, in another room. And they'll say, well, it's really hard because what if somebody needs me and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, yeah, somebody could need me too, but they can't have me at 11 o'clock at night. Um, I have recommended to a number of patients just getting a landline again for emergencies um, so that you're not taking your phone to bed because that's your or that shouldn't be your emergency phone, potentially. And also recognizing that health is a trajectory and not a binary. And what do I mean by that? We're changing beings. You know, what's that old thing? Like every cell in your body turns over every seven years. I'm not the same person I was seven years ago. Be selfish so you can be selfless. Yes. Does everyone know what Florentine means by that? That means... Sometimes we do have to take time for ourselves so that we can care for others. Yeah, that's something I talk to moms about a lot. And it's something I think about this time when I um, uh, was first an acupuncturist and I was working full time at Pacific as a teacher. I was associate academic dean. I had all this stuff going on. But whenever a PCOM would take a two week break, I would take a two week break. And I was going somewhere like Brazil or something like that. And I said to one of my patients, OK, I'll be out the next two weeks, but then I'll see you when I get back. And she said, oh, you're going on vacation again? And I said, yes. And she said, well, that must be nice for you. And I said, it is nice for me. And it's also nice for you to have an acupuncturist who isn't completely burned out, who's always happy to see you, who always has energy to see you, who's well-rested, and who cares how you're doing because she's doing okay herself. So that person got a little bit of a lecture, but that's okay. Um, the trajectory is we're always changing. We're always going to be needing to be tweaking what we're going through. I just went through menopause. Oh my goodness, what an adventure. That's a trajectory. It's not a binary. It's not I'm healthy or I'm well. And oftentimes people come in and they're like, I felt really good when I was 35. I want to feel like that again. And I say, well, let's see what it feels like to feel really good at 55. Um, let's bring what felt good about 35, vitality. Let's bring it engagement, a sense of play, a sense of fun, let's bring it. Um, a sense of adventure, let's bring it. Being able to wake up in the morning without joint pain and never having to exercise, <laughs> hard, hard. Yeah, clients are addicted to the behavior that's aggravating them. We're working with the energy of the habit. Absolutely. Well, me too, right? I'm creating, I'm creating my own problems and wins all the time, and what I need is support. And somebody who's like a little bit smarter than me about what, what's going on with me, a lot of my patients say, well, who treats you, you know, or can you treat yourself? And I say, sure, I can put a needle in myself, but can I look at myself from the outside and see what I need? Sometimes, not always. Depends. I tend to be a little meaner to myself, you know. My acupuncturist tends to do really nurturing, like nourishing points. And I tend to do moving points on myself, like, yeah, moving. And she's like, no, no, please rest. The doctor who treats himself has a fool for a patient. That's right. <laughs> okay. So what I'm really talking about is holistic medicine. Learning how to see, understand that everything connects to everything else. This is not a new idea. And it didn't start with Leonardo da Vinci. But it is what we're talking about. Um, and what we're talking about is the gap. So how are we doing for time here? Okay. Um, we're coming up on a break um, in five or 10 minutes. Uh, are we good to, we good to push through just a, f a few more minutes, then we'll take a break. Okay. I have a wonderful yoga teacher and I was talking to her about, thanks, Donna. 
Okay. I was talking to her about what is your advice for when you have, like, what can I tell a patient for when you have gotten off track and you haven't been exercising and your diet has slid and you haven't been, you know, you've, you've maybe gained a few pounds or whatever you were running, but you're not running and now you're out of shape, feeling like you can't run again. What do you do? And what do you tell people to do? And she gave me the opposite advice I'd, of any I'd ever heard before. And I absolutely love it. And I use it all the time, which is, and I think one of you sort of suggested this on the chat. She makes four acupuncture appointments. She goes in four times a week. She makes a massage appointment and she tries to go for a 10 minute walk whenever she can. And I was like, what? <laughs> and she said, I need to remind my body that I feel better when I am doing better. So acupuncture helps to balance me out. And then I remember what, how it feels in my body when my acupuncture, when my chi is flowing. And I go for a walk. I think she said prana, but you know what I mean? I go for a walk and I'm not trying to go for a run or push myself or beat myself up for being out of shape. I'm just reminding how good it feels to get outside for 10 minutes and look at the trees and breathe a little air and get a little mental reboot. So she was really talking about how do we bring it back? How do we get back on track? And she said, use pleasure. What we're trying to do is helping, and this is what supporting the patient, validating their choices. You're lying on the acupuncture table, getting back in touch with yourself. Instead of always being on your phone, you're back in touch with your feet. And what do your feet want to do? They want to walk. You're getting back in touch with your spleen, nourishing the energy of your spleen. And what does your spleen want to do? Extract nutrition. It doesn't want to eat brownies. You know, it wants to extract nutrition and bring up clear cognition into the brain and deliver the heart some materials to make blood and deliver the liver a package of chi to move around the body. The spleen is trying to be generative and it gets exhausted. And then what we do is try to like punch it in the face to get it going again. And what we want to do is nourish, nourish, and we can do it with ourselves too. So the gap um, has two pieces to it. This is when the patient has done everything that they can. They have made all the changes that they can, and they've made all the important changes, and they've made enough changes that it should be good enough. But we either have to, one, clean up some of the damage they did while they weren't on track, or two, it wasn't purely lifestyle to begin with. And I think this is something that in a certain way, some people overemphasize lifestyle as being everything. When the reality is you can have a vegan marathon runner with a cholesterol of 300. Now, maybe they have cholesterol 300 because a vegan marathoner is overtaxing their system and the body is holding cholesterol as false yin. Have you ever heard of false yin? So sometimes people have really high cholesterol because they're they're hitting it too hard this way. But some people say, well, it runs in my family. You know, we're all lean people. I eat a Mediterranean diet. I do yoga every day and my triglycerides are through the roof. So there is a gap where they're not really causing the problem. They're making very good choices. And that's sort of when acupuncture and herbs come into the picture. So we've cleaned up the lifestyle stuff. We've helped them decide like, you're eating too much, you're eating too little, more vegetables, more bone broth, you know, whatever that individual patient needs, whether we're trying to bring in more yin or we're trying to clear dampness, everybody needs a lot of fiber. Everybody needs to eat a rainbow. I don't know if you guys have ever, uh, how much nutrition class you've had, but all you really need to know about nutrition in my opinion, is that every vitamin expresses in produce in a different color. So vitamin A, I think is yellow and, you know, vitamin K is green and antioxidants are blue and purple. So if you go to the grocery store and you go to the produce section and you pick food whose flesh, not the skin, but the flesh is a rainbow and you buy that and you eat it, you're going to get everything you need. And you want to try to get 10 sources of produce a week, not 10 servings of spinach, but 10 different spinach, blueberries, uh, peaches, mangoes, red onion, sweet potato, pumpkin, 
zucchini, eggplant, every kind of bell pepper. You want to, you want all different colors. And if somebody's eating all different colors, it's going to give their gut biome all the prebiotics they need. It's going to give the small intestine all the vitamins that they need. It's going to give you a ton of fiber. And so if that's the center of your diet is making sure you're doing all of that. And for people with kids, making um, a chart on the wall and everybody gets to, gets a sticker every time they ate one of their colors in a day, you know, you'll get your kids involved in eating the rainbow too, which can be really helpful. Um, it helps mom if the kids, you know, to figure out a way for the kids to do it too. And then we're raising people who are coming up in a slightly healthier diet. Okay. Um, so that's the that's some that's some more food stuff. But the gap is okay. They're doing it. They're fine. They're making good decisions. They're doing great. But how are we um, going to figure out what they need next? And that's where we choose strategies. Um, the strategies of, are just the regular strategies of Chinese medicine, you know. And this goes back to our diagnosis piece. If you have a diagnosis of spleen sheet deficiency with dampness and phlegm, then our treatment strategies are gonna to be tonify spleen sheet, drain damp, transform phlegm, maybe transform food stagnation. Maybe they've, you know, and then we might look at how long have they had the spleen deficiency? How's their blood? You know, we're gonna look at what are some of our strategies gonna be. Um, drain damp, scatter cold, release the exterior, you know, and remembering the sort of core basic concepts of treating what's acute first, but we can always treat it in the context of what's chronic. And chronic is like their constitution, their lifestyle, what they're always dealing with, and then what's going on today. So, you know, we put out the fire before we talk about choosing fire resistant building materials. Um, so, so we choose our strategies. And then this is what we're going to talk about when we come back from the break. Once you have your strategy, how do you figure out what to do about it? Um, so we're going to take a break in just a minute. Does anybody have any questions? Cynthia, in the Q&A, you said you have a podcast. Well, by all means, everyone, if you have a podcast, share it in the chat. We'd all love to know about you. Thanks, Florentine. Okay. Donna, is this a 10-minute break? Okay, it's currently whatever time you are at, 03. So please come back at whatever time you're at, 13. Um, have a nice break, drink some water, move around a little bit, and I'll see you in 10 minutes, okay. <laughs> 